Hello, BookTube. For the last uh, roughly two weeks, uh, Frida and I have been vacationing up in Vermont at uh, the home of Mark Richardson of Richardson Reads, another booktuber, uh, and his family. And one of the highlights of that visit, uh, we went out and about, we went, we went all over hunting for books, but one of the highlights of that visit was that we decided on a long road trip from Vermont to Connecticut to the book barn in Niantic, Connecticut, a gigantic complex of buildings housing millions of used books. And it was great. We went to the book barn on the hottest day of the year, uh, but we managed, <laughs> we survived, we had a great time. It takes uh, pretty much all day, same as it does from Boston. If you're striking out from Boston, you're gonna get to the book barn in about three hours. You're gonna spend about three hours there. You're gonna get back in about three hours. So uh, I've never known a time, I've never known a trip to the book barn that didn't take pretty much the whole length of the day. Uh, and it did, and it was great. One of the reasons why it was great is because the book barn is a mecca, a used book mecca for book people in the United States. It's a place that they can put on their bucket list to go and see. There are only, there's only about 10 used bookstores that are like that, that are actually worth it. Not for walking in the door with a pinky in the air and saying, do you have a, a first edition of Atlas Shrugged? And having the clerk say, of course. Not that. I don't mean where you're going in and spending half your mortgage payment. I mean where you're going in and getting bags and bags of books and having a great time. In, in order to do that, you need high turnover and low prices. And uh, I, you may remember the videos that Mark and I made. We found a ton of books. We filled the back seat of the car. Uh, and I said at the time that I was a little booked out. Uh, but then I came back to Boston and I had an appointment in uh, downtown Boston very early this morning. And when I was leaving that appointment, I was a block away from the Brattle Bookshop here in Boston and realized you know, what I tend to forget, because it's so familiar to me, which is that the Brattle Bookshop is also a used book haven for, for book lovers in America. It's a, an old three-story building uh, in the heart of downtown Boston that is right next door to an open lot, where another building would ordinarily be, that is full of thousands of bargain books. One dollar, three dollar, and five dollar bargain books. Thousands of them. And the shop itself is nothing to sneeze at either. The first two floors are entirely stocked with affordable used books. And then the third floor is slightly less affordable, uh, rare and collectible type books. Great staff, constant turnover, just a fantastic place to go. I ought to remember that, that for a lot of people, the Brattle is a treat. The Brattle is a rare day-long day -long trip. I always uh, moan in envy a little at the people who live within easy striking distance of the book bar. Uh, but I do too. In a way, I do too. I live with an easy striking distance of one of the used book meccas in the country. So I went. <laughs> I went this morning. It was a beautiful, beautiful day. It's, it's just like walking around in a cool swimming pool. No heat, no humidity, no oppression of any kind. Just gorgeous. Absolutely gorgeous. With a slight, I'd say probably six or seven mile an hour following breeze that's just delightful. Just absolutely delightful. Uh, and I was in the neighborhood anyway, so I went to the Brattle. It turned out I was not booked out. I got a lot of books that I want to show them to you. Starting with this gorgeous thing. Never seen this before. I'm assuming it's UK only. Uh, this is Valerie, Vasily Grossman. This is Life and Fate. But it's in a vintage orange inheritance paperback. I've never seen this before. For a minute, when I saw it like this on the shelf, I thought it was a Penguin Classic. Uh, this is a, one of the great novels of... of you know, the last 50 years. It's a, uh, definitely a great, a, gay, a great Russian novel to go right alongside uh, War and Peace or Crime and Punishment or Dr. Zhivago or Quiet Close of the Dawn. It's, it's a great novel that I only have in a New York Review of Books paperback that isn't as, as attractive as this. So uh, all of these things were dirt cheap. All of these books were. And also they were helped even more by the fact that I had a gift certificate waiting for me from one of you. You know who you are, and I can't thank you enough. I can't thank you enough. It's always wonderful to have a gift certificate at the Brattle. I consumed it in no time at all. Uh, this next one is also a paperback. I believe these are the only paperbacks. Yes, these two are the only paperbacks. And I got this mainly for design. I've never seen a paperback with this design, with the cover of the hardcover. Uh, this is The Wall by the author of Hiroshima. A great big uh, historical novel about the, the founding and life in and eventually the extermination of the Warsaw Ghetto. Uh, a big, sprawling, ambitious novel that, like so much else this author wrote, 
is we've talked about this many times before is overshadowed by the one book of his that everybody knows everybody knows Hiroshima and it overshadows everything else that he did uh, but I I love this author and I'm, I'm learning to love him even more since there was a great biography of him Mr. Straight Arrow a few years ago that was everything that a literary biography should be and it made me, in addition to, uh, to all of its balance and its insight, it also did what all great literary biographies do, which is send you running back to the books. Uh, and it, I realized, you know, to my shame, uh, that rather predictably, when I finished that book, I realized that I only had Hiroshima. So I'm uh, happy to see this. This is, a, this is my favorite cover design. I did not know this was a trade paperback. Uh, and that's fantastic. Ta always in the mood for a strategic reread. Uh, then this next one is something that I've never read before, uh, but it, I'm, I was definitely in the mood after two weeks in uh, in small town Vermont. This is a countryman's journal. Uh, let me see, it's got a little, little schmutz on the cover, we don't want that. This is a countryman's journal by Roy Barrett, and this is uh, sort of a, you know, a day-by-day, week-by-week account of his of having a uh, seaside farm in Maine, and it's got... It's, it's full of illustrations uh, that I believe are by the author. Uh, look at that, there's sheep in a pen. And this is just what it's like to live on a dirt road in the middle of nowhere, to, to live by the seasons, to live by the, the moods of the ocean, and uh, to work the land. And I, I never read it. it. Books like this always fascinate me. Uh, especially now that I've spent, I've spent the last two weeks uh, in a small area, in an area where there's there's the sound of the rushing river at night, where there's an open canopy of stars overhead uh, at night, where there's usually a fine mist uh, on on the the slopes and the hills in the morning, and where there are animals everywhere. You might not always see them, but they are everywhere. Uh, so I'll be I'm definitely in the mood to read some rural nonfiction. Uh, then we have uh, fantasy, and this is a follow up. Uh, a while ago at the Brattle, I found a copy of Camber of Chaldee by Catherine Kurtz. The first book in a series set in, in a, a, uh, an alternate reality medieval kingdom, uh, much like Wales, where alongside humans there is a very uh, human-like second species of hominids, the Dorini, who have uh, advanced mental powers, telepathy and whatnot. Uh, that allows them to rule. It gives them an advantage over over ordinary humans, and uh, I've I've never really quite known what to do with the Camber of Caldi books. I've never known what to do with the Dorini Chronicles. They have fervid fans, but they always when I was I was buying I bought the mass market paperbacks because they had great covers uh, by I believe Daryl K. Sweet, and I I bought them way back when, you know, 40, 50 years ago, uh, wanting to like them, and just got such a strong Society for Creative Anachronism vibe off them that I, I never could quite like them. I certainly couldn't love them, and I've known lots of people who have. And I, a while ago, it might have been last year, I got uh, Camber of Culty in a hardcover with uh, one of those plastic library Mylar covers on it. Uh, someone had lovingly got and preserved and thought, all right, well, this is a nudge to revisit the Dorini Chronicles and see if you like them any better. Maybe it, the problem was you back then and not the books. Uh, and I, I, I started Camber of Chaldee and sort of wandered away from it because my reaction didn't seem to be any different from what it had been 50 years ago. It seemed my reaction was still largely, eh, okay, but I, you really have to be interested in wall sconces. <laughs> You really already have to be interested in flail maces or flagstone pavements. And if you're not, there's not going to be a whole lot else here to hold your interest. Uh, and I, that, that is wrong. I have the book, so I mean to read it. And today, just as a kick in the pants, and because all these things were either dirt cheap or free, I got the second volume, St. Camber. Again, probably the same person. It's a hardcover with one of these, uh, one of these dust jackets on it. So... I'll put them together. I am not intending to collect the whole set, but if the third volume, what is the third volume? If the third volume were to turn out, oh, this might not tell me what the third volume is. I think this is a first printing. Yeah, this is, the third volume is not listed in here. Uh, but 
if the third volume turns up, I might get that, but no others. No others. Uh, then this next one is a work of translation and commentary. This is a little bit late from maybe Midrash, but I've had this book many times, it, and it is great. I don't know why I keep getting rid of it, but I will try to hold on to this one. It's endlessly, endlessly fascinating. Uh, and this, it's the Gospel According to Jesus, translated by Stephen Mitchell, where he goes through the, the four canonical Gospels and pulls out not teachings about Jesus, but the teachings of Jesus, as he puts it. The parts of the Gospels where Jesus is actually teaching, as opposed to parts the, the many parts of all four Gospels where the writers are writing about Jesus. He pulls all of those out, he retranslates them, and he gives it a load of great commentary. Fantastic. Com the commentary is the reason to read this book. Uh, and I, I saw, as soon as I saw it, I realized I didn't have a copy, and I want one. Uh, whether it's maybe midrash or not, <laughs> I can, I'm never, I'm, I can never have enough first-rate, really intelligent uh, New Testament scholarship, uh, including, <laughs> including the new Norton Critical edition of the New Testament and Apocrypha, which the new edition of that, the one with the black spine and the you know the the, the black cover, as opposed to the brown editions that came out years ago. The new edition, made for schools, of the Norton Critical New Edition and Apocrypha has my name printed on the back. It has a blurb by me on the back. Me with a blurb on a New Testament. The King James New Testament. That's another, another New Testament and commentary that I really, really want. I just haven't made myself pull the trigger uh, to buy it. <laughs> but I, 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 this, it's, like, it's like a couple of friends of mine have now said to me, if you're not going to pull the trigger to buy that then what would you pull the trigger for? But I found this for dirt cheap, and it has a, it has a card in it. A season's greetings card. A lovely thing, until you get to the, to the writing on the inside. Dear Catherine, I am too busy to even get a letter out to insert. I must slow down sometime. Take care. And the P.S. is fond memories! Exclamation point. Which is a, a fairly long-winded way of saying what we would, how we would put it in South Boston, which would be F you. <laughs> one way or another I mean, it's gonna be a delight to go through this again I will read there there are commentaries in the back of the book on among other things there's a great short commentary on miracles on what miracles do in the New Testament and what they don't do but there's also a fantastic book length introduction to the thing great can't wait uh, then this next one I wish I had my prop in front of me I have this as a mass market paperback a pan mass market paperback from the UK I've read it a couple of times I really like it uh, and every time I read it, I think, uh, well, surely you should try and find a hardcover. But I've always thought, well, the hardcover is probably UK only, right? I mean, the paperback was probably brought over on a plane by somebody, and I'd have to go to the UK to find a hardcover. But no, I found it today. This is Peter Townsend's book on George VI, The Last Emperor. Uh, this is a, a biography of King George VI, uh, the wartime king, World War II king, uh, written by... A friend of his and an equerry. Uh, Townsend was, among other things, he had other claims to fame and infamy in the House of Windsor, but he was an equerry to King George VI. You can think of an equerry as a kind of high-level executive assistant, only one who swears to put his body in front of danger to his boss, <laughs> which high-level executive assistants don't do <laughs> and and i don't think that anybody actually expects a modern day equity to do that but nevertheless uh this is a terrific look uh, uh at king george the sixth i i really do believe uh that in my reading it is my favorite book on this king who i i mean there's a whole there was a whole generation of britishers that loved this guy naturally because he was their wartime monarch uh and because he, he had the good grace to die quickly and fairly young uh, from a lifetime of smoking. He, he like his uh, brothers and like his father, never stopped smoking. Just never, never did it. Uh, it was the very first thing that he thought about when he woke up in the morning. He dreamt about it at night. He did it while he was eating. He did it in the bath. He did it at every time when he wasn't actually forced by custom not to. That's the only reason he's not smoking in that picture. Or in any of the pictures in this book but it, it killed him as it will do when you do it that way and uh of all the books that i've read on him this one is my favorite uh, i just like the tone of it it's respectful but very intimate uh 
a person who is not encountering George VI uh, through the historical archives, not alone, not only the historical archives, but also lots and lots of time in the company of the man. So I'm very happy to find this as a hardcover. It will fill out my Windsor shelf. I can just sort of retire the paperback. I'll, I'll transfer. I have lots and lots of marginalia in that paperback. I will transfer all of that to this hardcover and then sort of put give the paperback an honorable burial so that I can go on with the hardcover. Uh, then we have, uh, this is an old thing. Uh, when did this come out? 1913. You will often find things like 1913 at the Bravel Sale lot. It doesn't, it doesn't really matter. Uh, you'll find all sorts of things there. This is by uh, Helen Clark, who was a great uh, Boston poetry editor a century ago, a uh, spotter of talent and also a promulgator of, of great talent. She would find poets she really liked and was really good at spreading the word, really good at communicating enthusiasm for poets, both well-known and not so well-known. Uh, and this is her book, Hawthorne's Country, uh, a, a, that is a sort of similar to, I don't know if any of you know Gil Hyatt's book, Poets in a Landscape, about all the, about a bunch of ancient Roman poets. Uh, but this is a, similar in its, in its approach to that, where it's sort of a biogeography. Uh, Helen Clark notes at the beginning of this book that there's no shortage of biographies on Nathaniel Hawthorne, and that was 100 years ago. There have been 100 of them since then. Uh, but that what she takes a different approach, which is to go at the places of Hawthorne, the places of his life, uh, both Boston and England, and a whole bunch of places in between. Of course, he's most known for uh, Salem, as the House of the Seven Gables. Uh, there, are, there are black and white photos all throughout here of there's the old state house in Boston. And that's what this is. This is sort of a, a biography of Hawthorne through the places of his life. I have seen this in a very old library where I'm a member here in Boston, but I've never owned a copy and never never gave it the freedom to really thumb through it at leisure. I'm hoping, it's, it's a forlorn hope it will never happen. I'm hoping that the person who got rid of this to the Brattle maybe had some of this author's other books. She wrote uh, two books like this on Browning on the poet Browning, both Brownings, uh, Browning's Italy and Browning's England. And she also did a book, the, the one, I mean, I love Hawthorne, absolutely love him, but she wrote, she did one book along these lines that I want even more, which is Longfellow's Country, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's Country. What I wouldn't give to add that to my collection of Longfellow books. But I was overjoyed to find this. I will be happy to add this to my collection of Hawthorne books because it's not quite the same, right? It's not quite the same as a normal... Uh, index card after index card chronological biography. It's more a look at the person through the places. I always find that fascinating. Uh, then we have a, a beautiful naked hardcover here uh, of an anthology of murder mysteries, again, from March Mystery Madness. This is The Dead Witness, edited by Michael Sims, a connoisseur of Victorian detective stories. Uh, and I, you've got all sorts, the usual suspects in here, uh, Charles Dickens and Wilkie Collins and... Uh, I, I can't remember who, what the Arthur Conan Doyle story is. You've got C.K. Chesterton, you've got Bret Hart, uh, uh, Mark Twain. Oh, okay, the, the little bit in here by Arthur Conan Doyle is the science of deduction. And this is just a lovely thing. I can never get enough of murder mystery anthologies if they're well done, if they're well put together. Uh, then this next one is, <laughs> you can hear that yappy dog. <laughs> I'm going to show you once again. I would not put up with a miserable dog for even a day, for even an afternoon in my proximity. I wouldn't do it. I never have, and I never will. The owners would hear from me. First, your dog was miserable for all the whole of the afternoon. Please don't let it happen again. And then, your dog was once again miserable for the whole of the afternoon. I am leaving you once again all of my contact information. I am happy to help, but this is not going to continue. And then the third note is, your dog was miserable after, all afternoon. Again, it's clear to me you're not taking any action. If this happens again, I will take your dog. <laughs> and you can just pursue me in court. I have all the evidence I need that you're mistreating the animal. And Boston doesn't like that. Uh, Boston laws don't like that. It'd be, a, it'd be an even to coin toss what would happen. I uh, <laughs> Never had anybody take me up on that. Usually owners aren't aware of how thoughtless they're being uh, about their, their pets. A lot of times owners don't have any idea that their dogs are miserable all day. Not everybody has the freedom 
to spend all day with their dogs. Uh, but nevertheless, I went over there. The first thing I always do before I confront the owners, who needs that? Who needs that kind of attitude? The first thing I always do is to go and consult the dog. <laughs> Are you, in fact, miserable? And he is very yappy, but he is not miserable. He's as happy as could be. And all of his needs are met. So, just so you know, just a, just a, a little side note there, as always. If you hear a yappy dog, he's not yapping in misery. Some of you who really know your dogs will know that's not the sound of an unhappy dog. But I thought I would, I would stress it anyway, since he's making guest appearances in so many of my videos. Uh, then this next one is a big World War II book. A big Nazi book that I really, really like. I, I'm always mystified when I get rid of it. <sighs> familiar for refrain with, with Brattle Book Halls. I'm hoping that I hold on to it this time. This is by Erica Johnson, and it is The Nazi Terror. And this is, uh, the subtitle is The Gestapo, The Jews, and Ordinary Germans, but the real focus of this book is the third part, Ordinary Germans, and what it was like for an authoritarian nightmare to envelop the world, your world, when you were living your life alongside your neighbors and never thought that it would happen. Never. I haven't read this book. I read it when it first came out. That would have been the early 2000s, I think. 1999. I read it when it first came out and really liked it. It was really impressive. Uh, but I haven't read it since. And in the time since 1999, America came extremely close to this exact same kind of slide into an authoritarian dictatorship. Extremely close. And not as close as it's going to come. The groundwork, the, the neo-Nazi party in America has been feverishly laying the groundwork for the slide to be real next time. Not close, but the real thing. Where you are disenfranchised. You don't get to vote anymore unless you vote our way. And if you don't vote our way, we have your bank records. Uh, the IRS has your information. We have your internet address. You will vote our way or you'll be really sorry for it. And there isn't. This isn't going to be you vote for our candidate. He wins the, a certain number of, of votes in the Electoral College, and then he, he is president for four years, and then he has to run for re-election again. It's not going to be that. That isn't what was wanted. That isn't what's wanted right now. There are farcical vote recounts going on in a handful of American states right now about the 2020 election that's half a year away. There are vote counts going on now, and those vote counts do not want a fair outcome for any election. They want one guy instated in power for the rest of his natural life. After which, we'll see. He has children. They all want that power. Maybe it'll go to them. The, the, this is now an authoritarian majority country by a whisker, but I would argue that that whisker is getting wider all the time. And that is going to make a book like this, where ordinary people are seeing this happen all around them. And what are their choices? You have two choices. You can either buckle down, lower your head, and just hope to get through it somehow, or you can leave the country. You don't really have any other choices than that if you're a good, upstanding, normal person. The tiny majority that, or minority that wasn't, that weren't good, upstanding, normal people, joined the oppressor. Uh, and you're seeing that, you're seeing, you see, there are all sorts of telltale signs about that in America today almost 100% of the neo-Nazi constituency in this country, so 100 million people, don't believe that Joe Biden is a legitimate president of the United States. Probably a third of that number believe that not only was the election of 2020 rigged, but that Donald Trump won it anyway, and is actually still president. And that all their, everything they're seeing is some sort of elaborate dumb show. That's That's that fraction of the, the neo-Nazi base that I'm talking about is tens of millions of people who are living completely delusional lives and are willing to do anything. The, the key here, the neo-Nazi party in the United States, just like the, the uh, Nazi party in the 1930s, realizes that its main obstacle to gaining and holding power is representative democracy. Not the strength or weakness of its candidates, but the system of free democracy. That is the main obstacle. And the neo-Nazi party in America is working really hard to get rid of that obstacle. You've got, you've got 10 places in your county to vote? Well, how about we reduce it to one? You've got, uh, that place is open from nine to five? What about from nine to four or from 10 to four? 
Uh, you need two forms of ID to register to vote. How, how about you need three forms of ID to register to vote and three forms of ID when you go to vote? Totally illegal. But how about you need to produce them then, too? Uh, even though we've got your name on the roll already. Uh, and and so on, and so on, and so on. The most infamous thing being that you can't hand out refreshments, water, to people who are, uh, to black people, who are being forced to wait in line all day in order to cast their vote in an allegedly free country. There are laws on the books in states now where you can't do that. There are only going to be more of those laws. This, this uh, 2020 was a trial run of what could and could not happen. And so this is only going to get worse and that is going to give an extra resonance to reading books like this i noticed i read i reread uh uh what was it that i read uh a fairly newish book it's called culture in the third right that i have here somewhere uh and <laughs> i i read that during the trump administration during the administration of a racist, sexist, fascist, lying moron who expected to be in office for the rest of his life. Uh, and who, who, who isn't in office right now illegally and with the support of the military only because he was a moron. <laughs> anyway, anyway, uh, I read that, I believe it was cu Culture in Nazi Germany. I read that book and was just shocked by the extra resonances. And that's what this is going to have. This is going to be spot on for that. So... Uh, we shall see. We shall see what it's like. Uh, then this next one, I there's really no reason for this except that uh, I love it. It's a big hardcover of a thousand page book. I have it as an ebook, and I'm glad to get it as a mass market paperback. But I saw it as a hardcover, and all of these things were dirt cheap. And this had a resonance with me. This is James Mishner, uh, and this is his book Space. A big fat thing about man mankind's. Uh, race into space about the, the effort to send men into orbit to send men around the world to send men to the moon and there's a thread a, a tissue of fictional plots involved here characters speaking and whatnot that happens if you're familiar with the james missioner formula that happens in almost all of his books and it's not convincing and i don't think it's meant to be rather it is meant to put uh a kind of a sweet wrapping around an enormous amount of exposition done fantastically well. That's the main appeal for me with Mishner and books like this, is the huge amount of expedition they deliver completely painlessly, enthrallingly, actually. And that's what this is, and I don't, I don't have any other Mishner in hardcover. I'm not sure that I need any other Mishner in hardcover. The only other one that I might get would be Chesapeake, which does the same thing. It, it imparts a vast amount of exposition to you in the form of, of what nominally is a novel. Uh, I have, there's, there's our author, Kate Canaveral. I, I, I uh, am a big fan of Mishner anyway. I'm not 100% sure um, why he has so thoroughly vanished. I'm not 100% sure of the condescension that has almost always accompanied mention of his books. I don't really get that. They're, they're quite scrupulous and quite good. I'm, I'm not 100%. With him and with a bunch of other mid-20th century best-selling authors, I don't understand what the critical world refers to as the reception. And maybe it just needs time to settle. I don't know one way or another. I know it's the same thing with a bunch of other authors. Uh, we saw MMK, for instance, on this channel. Uh, and also, uh, uh, Herman Wook be another one where I, I don't really understand what what we're calling the reception and I guess more time is needed but one way or another I'm not saying that James Mishner is any great literary genius but his books are something in a, in a way very conspicuously are something in a way that they a lot of their contemporaries are not uh, anyway it doesn't matter I'm gonna reinforce this and just read it slowly for the fun of it uh, because of the way that it that it chronicles the step-by-step, personality-by-personality growth of the American space industry. Uh, and then the last book that we've got, believe it or not, we got all the way to the end here, is a uh, bit of an oddity. I've never seen it before. I will, I will happily... Uh, I'll happily read it. It's heavily illustrated. It's something... It's by Arjan Singh, edited by John Moorhead, and it's called Tiger Haven. And it's a heavily illustrated book about a nature preserve, basically a nature preserve, uh, that a man in India set up in order to preserve some of the uh, the native 
wildlife in a place where in a in a country that was encroaching on that wildlife and that in a place that may where maybe they could be free of uh inroads or poaching or anything like that and uh i think that's just fascinating i think there's a map here of where tiger haven is yes there's there is the map and there is tiger haven up there uh I uh, have never seen this thing before. I don't think this is the famous Arjun Singh. I really think this is somebody else with the same name. I, I, I don't. I find it hard to believe that, that, that the Arjun, the only Arjun Singh that I know of, would have had time or opportunity or inclination to write a book like this. Uh, I'll, have to, I'll have to research that and find out. But one way or another, I am well familiar with India. I love it dearly. And I'm well familiar with its wildlife. Trekked many, many a back road. Uh, and encountered a lot of that wildlife. So this will be fascinating. And again, the nice thing about the Brattle Bookshop, especially the sale lot outside, I don't think I bought anything inside today. Uh, the nice thing about the sale lot is that you you can experiment. You can take a chance. These are all cheap and extra cheap thanks to a gift certificate. So it was easy to do. I can take a chance on this. And if I don't like it, it'll go in the Brattle pile that's always building in the kitchen to go back to them. When that pile gets to a certain size, I just call them over to come and get them. So kind of a slow motion uh, lending library with monetary exchanges involved. <laughs> uh, but anyway, there you have it. That is a Brattle book haul. My first one since I got back from Vermont. This We have Tiger Haven uh, by, I'm assuming, the other Arjun Singh. Uh, then we have Space by James Mishner. I'll fix that up and start in on as soon as I'm done with Wolf Hall. Then Nazi Terror, a book about what ordinary Germans thought about the growth of the Nazi movement among them. Uh, the Dead Witness, a very attractive naked hardcover uh, anthology of Victorian detective stories. Hawthorne's Country, uh, a fully illustrated 100-year-old book about the places that Nathaniel Hawthorne lived and what he thought about them. Uh, the Last Emperor uh, by Peter Townsend uh, about George VI from a man who knew him well day to day. We have The Gospel According to Jesus by the great translator Stephen Mitchell. Uh, we have St. Camber, second book in the Chronicles of... Uh, Drini by Catherine Kurtz. We have A Countryman's Journal about uh, small town life in Maine. We have The Wall in this lovely uh, facsimile trade paperback edition that I've, that it's going to be a lot of fun to re-encounter it that way. And finally, Life and Fate in this uh, orange inheritance, orange prize Perhaps the Queen is in town. <laughs> I guess this is connected, it's published in association with the Orange Prize for Fiction. So do any of you know this? Do any of you know if there are other books in this series? Uh, I'm assuming this is UK. Uh, but one way or another, it's the prettiest edition of uh, Life and Fate that I have ever seen. So um, I was glad to get it, and it was a dollar. So so there you go. It's a Brattle book haul. <laughs> I don't imagine there'll be another one until next week, uh, but we shall see. <laughs> in the meantime, I'm going to wrap this up, but I'll be back. Thank you, Book Two.